High Life Group leaders, we have one more lesson left in James. This is the second to last one. We're in James chapter 4 this week. And then we're going to move on to Genesis. So uh, hopefully you're aware that your books are in your classroom and you can distribute those to your class whenever you're ready. As we begin today, I just want to say thank you uh, for all that you do. You are the lifeblood of our church. You are the first line of ministry when when people are hurt or wounded or in need. And you guys really uh, make our church function and thrive and be the place that people do want to belong and believe and become at. And I know there's been a lot of transition in the last few months. And I just want to say thank you guys for just being faithful and loving the 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 sheep of your pasture uh, hang in there. I think God's got some great stuff in store for us, but I just I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, I haven't done that, uh, but I really appreciate all that you do as you uh, help help just lead our people in God's word and help them to become something more than what they are. So uh, thanks for the sacrifice that you put in each and every week as you prepare a lesson. I really appreciate it. And now uh, we're going to start in James chapter 4. Our lesson starts with verse 6, but I'm going to read verses 4 and 5. Because in in verses 4 and 5, this is where James really brings up the issue that he addresses in the rest of the passage, which is now he's confronting his audience, uh, the people that he was writing to, with another serious problem that they have, and that's adultery. If you look in verse 4, you adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? And we all know what adultery is. It's a, it's a broken vow, and it's betrayal, and it's pain, and sorrow, and loss. And so the question we have to ask is, were they all committing adultery with their spouses? And the answer is no. They were committing spiritual adultery. And what I mean by that is that the Bible describes the relationship that God wants us to have uh, with Him in, in extremely personal terms. According to Paul, when we receive Christ in 2 Corinthians that we commit ourselves in marriage to him. And this relationship uh, will not be fully complete until Christ returns, but we, in effect, as becoming believers, have entered into a permanent arrangement, a formal relationship with him, in which we've made a commitment to give our deepest devotion and service to only him. James says that God has a passionate reaction when Christians just break that vow and start flirting or engaging with what he calls the world. Uh, You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? So that brings us to question, what is the world? Uh, And you use that in quotations if you want to. What is the world? It's not the physical earth. It's not other people. Uh, God loves those things. He made those things. We should love them too. Nor is the world just about specific things that people do to entertain themselves, like playing cards or dancing or watching movies. Uh, because you can, you can play cards and you can dance and you can watch movies and not be corrupted by the world. Or you can abstain from those things and be deeply entangled in the world. There's something much deeper here that's being talked about. The word, the world, in the Bible is the word cosmos, and it, me, and it really means an ordered arrangement or an ordered system. It's where we get our word cosmetic from because you order this and make this an arrangement. But it basically means the counterpart of the system of values and objectives and uh, things that we give our, our feelings to, which are designed to seduce us from our relationship in God. In other words... The world or the cosmos is a highly, highly sophisticated, uh, subtle, and seductive idol. In in the book of Revelation, the metaphor is used of the world as a prostitute that seduces people and destroys their souls. In 1 John chapter 2, John tells us that the world is made up of three things. And these things are the essence of the world. Uh, As with all temptation, each one of them is a perversion of something that God originally made as good. Uh, Those three things he describes as the lust of the flesh, which is essentially sensual gratification, whether that's sexual or just eating a lot of food. There's lots of ways you can satisfy the lust of the flesh. There's also the lust of the eyes, which is materialism. It's just wanting more, and they've got stuff that I don't have. 
And then the last one he describes as the pride of life uh, or uh, of the flesh. And basically that's living with self-determination that I want to be independent from God. I don't want to have to have him tell me what to do. I want to be able to determine my own destiny. And you see the, you see the pride of life being displayed in James in, in our text today in 13 through 16. So you can see even in, in James, he's talking about the pride that can, that can sneak in and rob us of uh, where we are, where we're supposed to be in Jesus, and that is, in effect, the world. And James is trying to caution his readers that flirting with the world is dangerous to our souls. It should be obvious that because of its dominance, that it's everywhere, and that it's and of its subtlety, that it's, it's very insidious, that it's easy to spend your entire life entangled in the world. Uh, we need to remember its purpose, that its purpose is to distract ourselves from knowing God so that in return we lose our lives. For and Christians who say that it, this kind of entrapment doesn't happen to them are either incredibly arrogant or they're very deceived. Many of us will have to admit that we've been flirting with the world, and some of us will have to admit that we've been committing full-on adultery uh, to the one who is faithful to us, that we've allowed ourselves to be seduced by the world, uh, and that's the world is only using us to hurt God. So James gives us some practical steps to free ourselves from uh, the adultery with the world. How can we live a life that's free from spiritual adultery? a.k.a. resisting the devil that's you can see in verse 7. James gives us the steps that we need to take. Notice the extent of God's grace in verse 6. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. No matter how far you've gone, he's so loving that he's always willing to take us back and to rebuild the relationship. James explains how to experience this grace that God gives us in 7 through 10 in our text, and he gives us three very specific steps to, to carry it out, but I want us to look at them in reverse order because it flows a little bit better. I think the first thing that James is telling us to do is to recognize our own betrayal and to to get out of this these words that, that he mentions that we need to draw close to God, that we need to purify our hearts, we need to wash our hands, we need to repent, we need to humble ourselves in verses 8 and through 10. And the reason why is because there can be no true reconciliation in our marriage relationship that has experienced this kind of betrayal that we give to God unless we as the adulterer confess, unless we assume responsibility, unless we ask for forgiveness, and that we clearly are uh, changing direction from the adulterous relationship. That's why jo James spends so much time here on this idea of we need to to recognize and confess and repent and have the sorrow that's in 8 through 10. What is it about? Here's the reason why. Only before God we have to recognize our infidelity specifically without any kind of rationalization or justification. This was Adam and Eve's problem in the beginning was that it was somebody else's fault that they messed up. And we should call our behavior for what it is, that it is a sin, that it is spiritual adultery, and then throw ourselves at the mercy of God. Now when we do confess to God, James tells us in verse 10 that the grace of God will come in, and then it says he will exalt us. He won't just take us back under some kind of like, well, I'm supposed to, or I guess I have to, or because it's some kind of obligation. God will raise us up and, and appreciate us as one of his most uh, prized possessions. He'll fill your heart with assurance and forgiveness and delight in his commitment to you and me. And that's what's amazing about grace is there doesn't make any sense. Why would he do that? But he does. Because... But just confession is not enough because unless you replace your involvement in the world with with God, then you will be pulled back into it. Uh, there's one thing that science teaches us is that vacuums don't exist in nature. And so if you pull something out of your life, you better have something there to fill it or whatever you pulled out is just going to rush right back in. And that's why James gives us two additional steps. The second thing is, as he says, to start an intimate relationship with God in verse 8. Draw near to God in order to just restore this relationship, after we've drifted away, 
not only does there have to be sincere repentance and forgiveness, we also then have to pursue intimacy with God. Essentially what James is getting at here is that we need to draw near to God, that we need to pursue Him. Now, unlike many marriages, God never distanced Himself from us uh, or that He decided He was taking care of His own needs before He attended to us or whatever. We're always the ones who moved away from Him in the relationship when we're attracted to the world and therefore we're the ones who then need to return to Him. And, you know, you can ask your class this question, do you feel distant from God? Well, guess who moved? It wasn't God. Oswald Sanders, uh, he says this, You are now as close to God as you habitually choose or do not wish to be. And here's something, of course, that you already know, but having this intimacy with God and pursuing that relationship with Him, it's the best way to prevent falling in love with the world in the first place. And here's what happens when we seek to draw near to God. The promise that we have in James is then that God will draw near to us without any, without any reproach, without any um, desire to just grind us down with, I can't believe you did this. God responds by sharing with us and showing us his love in various ways. God knows our hearts perfectly and therefore responds immediately to our act of repentance. Then James has one more step for us in verse 7, that we need to get involved in, in spiritual warfare on God's side as his servant. And that's the, the last thing that we can do to continue to experience this grace and to reject the world, but is then to go and fight the world. He's when you look at this verse, the, the your translation may have submit, it may have humble, but uh, both the resist and the submit or humble, they are both military terms. Submit is not a passive word. It's not, I give up. It, it actually means to seek God's direction in my role of service to him and then, and then obeying that order with all of my passion. And resist basically means to refuse to be distracted from that order or that service, no matter how intimidating or tempting is that distraction. If we truly want to be delivered from being seduced by the world, we have to cultivate this sort of wartime mentality. And as a church, our, one of our main purposes is to make it easier for you to fight this battle. That's why we have life groups. That's why we have D groups. That's why we have family summits. That's why we try to, to equip our children and our teenagers to know God's word. It's why we have um, places for you to serve because we're not playing church. We're equipping you and deploying you in a war for souls. We, our church is a place to triage the wounded. It's a place to recover for the next battle, but it's also a place to engage in that battle for people. And that's what James is getting at here in verse seven is that when we, when we humble ourselves or submit ourselves, when we resist the devil, then he will flee from us. That is the grace of God. Satan's authority over our lives will break down as we submit to God. And as we walk humbly with God, as we stay in vital contact with him, as we remain in our lane or we remain where we are ordered to be in active service, Satan's going to try to disrupt us in a lot of different ways, but he's not going to cause us to stumble away from God. And that, again, is a callback to what we studied in Galatians in, in chapter 5, that if we walk with the Spirit, we won't satisfy the desires of the flesh. We won't fall into the temptation of Satan, and we won't commit spiritual adultery. Okay, and as I just wind this down, there's a couple of other questions that you can ask your class the, in addition to what's found in our material this week. The first one is this, is one, what makes it so difficult for people to submit to God? What makes it difficult to humble themselves before him? And then the second one is, what examples can you give from Scripture about how God opposes the proud? What example can you give from Scripture about how God gives grace to the humble? And then just, you know, have your class bat those ideas around, and maybe they'll get you a good place in discussion as well. And so that's James chapter 4. We've got one more unit in James, and Tom will be teaching that next week. But I just want to pray for you, especially as we begin a holiday week, just that you would be able to uh, 
maybe connect to people that aren't there. I know between Thanksgiving and hunting season, your, your numbers may be low, but this is the perfect opportunity for you just to reach out to your class and say, hey, we missed you. How can I pray for you? And uh, I would extend the same to you. You guys have a class. You're my class. Let me know how I can pray for you. And uh, with that, uh, just asking God to bless you this week, that you'll have a great uh, discussion in James. And let me know if there's anything I can do for you. Godspeed.